So good afternoon again. Here we are for our second San Lo show today on the 76th anniversary of the liberation of the city. Um, I hope you all watched the earlier show with the amazing Joe Balkowski, who again astounded us with his incredible knowledge of the 29th Division and all things related to combat in Normandy. He's just a master of, of, of information. But today, well, this show, we have a different type of expert. We've got a local girl, Karine, is from Caen. You may remember Karine from our uh, Charnwood show. So good evening, Karine. Good evening. And Karine's going to give us the perspective of the French civilian point of view, because the earlier show was very much about the battle for San Lo. And now we're going to talk about really the remains of the city, what happened to the, the, the people there, what there is to see in the city today if you if you come to from to Normandy. And um, I'll bring up a map to show you where we are again. If you I'm hoping you watch the first show. If not, go back and watch it. But earlier we talked about the approach from the east of the 116th and the 175th coming in this way from Martinville Ridge. You follow my cursor there. Um, today, or this show, Duncan and Mag are our camera team with Francois driving. They're up here on the same road we well near where we started near la luzerne the first show show this they're, they're on the d6 road there which runs from isigny sur mer up near the coast down uh southwest into the town of san lo and we're going to follow in a few minutes when we drive off the route of cota's task force that's general norman cota the assistant divisional commander of the 29th division and and a, a mixed group of 115th 116th um divisional headquarters guys and some wolverines m10 tank destroyers who trundled down this road and we'll do that drive and this tour this show won't be completely chronologically correct in terms of the order we're doing it in the order of the sites we will visit so we're going back and forth during the timeline a little bit um because of, of what we're doing today and um we'll start with with duncan well there's mag's view of the you know saying that we are just three kilometers north of san lo um, that's probably allowing for the fact San Lo is slightly bigger today. It was a slightly more compact city back in World War II, but we're just a you know a couple of miles north of the city. And Duncan's view is of San Lo. So there we are. We're looking southwest towards San Lo, and you can see the the, the extended city in the, on the horizon there. So we're just about a mile to the west of where we started the first show with with Joe. And then we're going to move down and talk about the attack into, well, not so much the attack, the, the arrival of Cota's task force. So um, great, guys. I think we can we can head our way into um, into the city now. And, and Karina and I will start talking about the events of, you remember, 76 years ago today. So Joe gave us this incredible talk about the battle and the, the, the masterstroke by Gerhardt to attack from the east and envelop the town, the Germans of a, a kind of falling back to the ridge behind and so there was still some um there was still some combat ahead but the the worst of the fighting i think was over by this time or by the, the morning of the 18th of july 76 years ago and we'll just try to take you around the city and show you some various things and of course um we've got tom clone is watching our great friend tc a friend the the, the, the king of normandy from south carolina comes over every year not this year of course who is a big fan of, of Thomas Howie because he's a South Carolina boy, is Tom, and so was Thomas Howie. And Joe took us up to the events of Thomas Howie's death. When you remember, you watched the earlier show, he was killed near the, somewhere between the Martinville Ridge and the main road into San Lo, and people debate over exactly where he was killed. But he was, um, later on in the battle, his body was put, well, not in the battle, in the day, his fallen body, his dead body was put on a hood of a Jeep and they drove the Jeep very sort of slowly and like a ceremony down into town. This is on General Gerhardt's order. And um, we will go to where his body was laid uh, in, in front of the church San Croix earlier today. And Mag and Duncan in between the shows snapped a couple of photos at the ceremony that took place earlier this afternoon for Thomas Howie. And so I'll, I'll bring up a couple of photos of that later on. So I'm reminding you when you're watching a World War II TV show like this, we are doing it live from the battlefields. And in this case, 76 years on to the day of these events occurring. So it's that that's the model of this the, you know, format here is to bring you these events on the time. So, so Karine, you know, you're, you're, we, we, we talked about Caen the other day, but San Lo is the departmental city of La Manche, isn't it? So it, had, it, it's a, it was an important town. What was its history in the, in the centuries leading up to, to, to World War II? I mean, briefly, we don't have to go back to prehistoric times, but give us an idea of what, what the city, was it commerce? Was it farming? 
give a, give a, give a bit of a background for our audience. Well, Salo has not always been the administrative center of this part of Normandy. It's only at the French Revolution that it became. Uh, before, it was not um, a big, big city. Um, and it's, was, it is still not a big city. Nowadays, it has less than 20,000 inhabitants and uh, less in, 19, in the 40s when World War II happened. Uh, it became an, uh, the administrative center of the Département de la Manche at the French Revolution, and it was um, composed of a lot of uh, shopping places for the farming communities living around and a lot of religious communities, because it used to be uh, owned uh, by the Bishop of Coutances. Mm -hmm. And uh, downtown Saint-Lô, the old sector is nicknamed the, the castle or the enclosure. It used to be the, the property of the Bishop of Coutances. So lots of nuns, lots of religious people, and uh, a quiet little town, but uh, that had an, an administrative importance with a lot of notable people. And so we've got Mag's camera view there. So Mag's in the front of Francois's van there. So this is the road into town on the D6. This bit's still fairly authentic. Then when you get close to the town, of course, there's some modern apartment buildings and, and commerce and things. So the actual central part of Saint-Lô has changed uh, this bit we're at now is, you know, this would have been effectively field 76 years ago. But we are doing this historic route 76 years on. And the first stop we're going to be uh, calling at is the cemetery. And, and our two camera teams will go in two respective directions and um, and show us two different things there. So they're there already. And, um, and don't forget, Duncan hurt his ankle on the recce for this two days ago. So he's slightly, slightly slower than he normally is. But um, I don't think anything to worry about. So... Our camera teams are going. There's a plaque just outside the, the church, the, uh, the cemetery there, which they'll show us, which is commemorating General Gerhardt, the commanding officer of the 29th Division, who Joe told us about in the first show, was was in a very effective training officer, officer, a little bit of a discipline freak. It's fair to say he was a, he was more organization and routine than he was kind of dash. But I suppose Cota, his second in command, gave the dash. Uh, to compensate for Gerhardt's more sort of steady approach, should we, shall we say. Um, but they're going to go inside the cemetery now. And um, so they're going two directions. So this is still the current civilian cemetery for for, for San Lo. So, Karine, um, do we know when this cemetery was established? I mean, several hundred years ago, I'm guessing. Oh, yes, it was. Uh, there was a cemetery here for centuries and uh, still at the same place. So many different generations, many different... Uh parts of history uh, yes concerned in this cemetery and you so can see typical... very modern tombs with glass and marble oh, yes. and you can see very ancient tools tombs so the first stop on this tour is a mausoleum a a, a above ground crypt mm -hmm. uh to the family blanche blanchard blanche and this this was one of several you can see in the in the rear of duncan's shot there there are other um, crypts, uh, mausoleums like this one here, but this one became very important. Um, and later on, we're going to get to the a roundabout, which was a, cro a crossroads back then where Cota's task force kind of hit the town. And there's some famous footage you can find it on YouTube of the 115th Infantry and the M10 Wolverines engaging Germans around the crossroads. And initially, um, Major Glover Johns, well, the, the communications officer, set up his headquarters near the crossroads, but there was so much fire, uh, mortar corner, the 29ers called it they set up a communication center in this mausoleum so Duncan will take us in here which is why today 76 years on it's always open because it's a it's a stop on the on the tourist circuit in San Lo if you come to the village the town now and pick up the, the, the little brochure you it'll it'll take show you how to get here and this is a building where communications are set up so I'll um I'll, I'll let Kareen talk about the, the the use of this and I'll flash up the photos so if you want to Carry on talking, Karine. I'll bring up the photos. Mm -hmm. Well, the mausoleum of uh, the family Blanchet was set up uh, to um, host the final resting place of a famous professor of Saint-Lô. Um, he had developed uh, techniques to treat um, people who were blind or who couldn't hear, couldn't um, uh, talk. And he had created an institution for blind people and people who were deaf and mute in, uh, in Saint-Lô. And uh, so it's typical of France uh, until 
recently, because now it is not so common anymore, but these kind of big tombs, like a small chapel uh, outside, above ground, and down under the ground, uh, they could put several coffins of the same family. And so it, it's revealed itself to be a safe place uh, for uh, Major Johns to have his headquarters and radio uh, uh, equipment and maps. And so it's a funny uh, location that people can visit. And when we go there with visitors, uh, they are always a little bit scared to go downstairs in the grave and, uh, and very impressed by being on the site of, uh, of what happened in, uh, in July 1944. And here's another shot here from the outside. And Duncan will go out there again and show us that. And um, you, know, you can see the 29 is in front of it there. And the, bit, the photo I showed of the interior, the downstairs, it, 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 there's a bit of a, a mystery because it doesn't appear to be the same more. There's Duncan down there. The one in the photo doesn't seem to be the same one. So it seems at, another, at various points they set up in other mausoleums in, and tombs Can inside the it. churchyard. Because mm. that photo, although it looks like it could be, the same place it, it really isn't but it does give a representation of of the fact of what was going on but i must stress it's not actually the same same crypt but yeah. a similar procedure there's a telephone exchange yeah. there but and there's a bit of hessian cloth they put there i guess to, to muffle the sound or something but this became a communication center and of course for those watching this if you haven't already read uh Major Glover John's book, The Clay Pigeons of San Lo. It's one of those classic combat tales. And Joe Balkowski was involved in creating the, the re-edition of it a few years ago. So I, I urge you to read that. It's a great book telling you, you know, what it's like to be a, uh, an officer in a, in, a, in a unit in combat in Normandy and all the fighting for San Lo. So there's Duncan down there. His signal is pretty bad down there. And then I want to cut back to, uh, to Mag in a minute because Mag is at a different part of the cemetery. But um, that's this famous um, building that was used for communications dur during the uh, several days of, of combat in San Lo. So I'll, do, I'll just let Duncan match up that outside shot again. If you can do the shot of the front, Duncan, then I'll go back to um, to Mag and let you move on to the roundabout. So it'll just in a minute, Duncan will turn around and then we can match up that sh shot again. So there, there it is. There's the Morsley. There's the building there. And I'll, I'll bring up the photo again and then we can just, you know, Really, really make sure we know we're in that authentic location. I've just got to find the exact photo again. It's my usual thing where the photos move around in within. So there we are. There's the building there. And um, yeah, it's a bit of, amazing bit of history. So that's just a little trivia stop there on the tour. And it proves there is still stuff to see in San Lo, even though the city was largely destroyed. So changing the subject because we've lost the cover tonight. We'll we'll move to Mag and, and Mag. Um, we'll, we'll join in and talk a little bit here as well, but because Mag... As she said in the earlier show, was born in San Lo. She's a San Lo girl. So, so where are you now, Mag? Tell us what you're looking at. I'm at um, the same cemetery Duncan is, uh, but I'm on the um, section where civilians uh, were buried, um, which is not really usual. We don't see much, uh, you know, parts of cemetery, cemeteries like that with um, dozens of, uh, of graves for civilians and. What's really special for this one, so we, uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about that later on, but there's about at least nearly 400 um, people from saint Lô that who died uh, under the bombardments. Um, so on those graves, sometimes you've got a name, sometimes you've got a known, uh, sometimes you have uh, like a body found on that street, um, body of an old lady. Um, so it's... Um, very touching uh, to, to be facing those graves. Um, there's one that I just saw that says uh, young boy, um, probably Lemoine, which means they were unable to really un um, identify them uh, to be 100% certain about the uh, identity. Uh, and I guess they haven't recovered all the bodies anyway um, after the bombardments. So that's where I am. So, and I'll ask Karine to step in there. So we're, we're going back this, most of these victims of the bombing was back to June the 6th, wasn't it? So I'll let, you know. June the 6th and the 7th, yes. And so um, for, the, for our, our audience, you know, explain why we were bombing, so, you know, relatively far inland, 25 miles inland, we were bombing yeah. it on June the 6th. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, uh, Sanlo is quite far away inland, as uh, you know, of course. And um, they could not hear very well um, the noise of the battle happening on the beaches when it started. But they could hear something far away 
Um, they were woken up early in the morning with that strange noise, and some of them quickly understood that it was the landings they had been waiting for for such a long time that had started. And they felt um, happy. Um, they were quite confident because, because being so far away from the coastline, they were not worried about being uh, becoming uh, collateral damages, as we say now, but of course in those days they were not telling the same. And uh, they were really happy and uh, they could see quite a panic in the German ranks. So they were getting prepared to get liberated probably soon. And they went to dinner in the evening. Uh, there had been an aircraft uh, that had, some aircraft, sorry, that had flown away here and there, but nothing really scary. And then at eight o'clock in the evening, some uh, bomber planes came and dropped bombs. Um, I read witnessings about civilians who were really, really surprised because of there had been several air attacks in Saint-Lô before. That had been quite precise. And the people of Saint-Lô uh, were telling each other, you see all what you, we read in the newspapers and remember that the French newspapers were only propaganda, a kind of Vichy uh, government propaganda the collaborators or German propaganda, telling that the Anglo-Americans were killing uh, civilians uh, by destroying, by bombing uh, at random uh, different objectives, including civilian objectives. And the people of Salo say, you see, it's not true what we read in the newspapers. It's only propaganda because they can be very precise. So when the air bombing started at eight o'clock in the evening, uh, they, they were not scared. And it's when the first bombs fell on the buildings that they realized that they were being bombarded. It was a big panic and a lot of people were trapped in their stone buildings that collapsed. So, and we, we must, for those watching, the reason San Lo is being bombed is, bombed is it's, you know, twofold. It's a crossroads town, so therefore it's a potential route for German counterattacks, but also, um, we, we're probably knowing from the ultra decrypts that, that there is a headquarters. The General Marx uh, had his bunker across on the hill. In fact, opposite where Mag is, is viewing is across on the hill is kind of where General Marx's bunker was. And so we, we, there may be a suggestion that, you know, you can knock that out. You're going to knock out a key German commander in, in the defensive. Unit. So it may be the ultra decrypts. But either way, as, as we know, as the Normandy battle went on, many, many cities and towns received lots and lots of bombs. But San Lo on June the 6th, you know, uh, was a was a was a pretty momentous day, um, and so Mag is still inside the cemetery, showing us the um, the graves there. And then Mag is going to carry on fairly so shortly to to her next stop, which is the church. And that you know, you can see we'll be showing you lots of views of the city, and there's bomb 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 damage on some of the earlier graves, like we had earlier with the, with the cemetery in Saint Andre de Lepin. And we'll show you photos of the city was, you know, and Karine will talk about it, nearly entirely destroyed. And so there are very few historic buildings in some of the sectors of the town and other places, some of it survived quite well. But um, Duncan is now moved to, um, uh, well, it's now a roundabout. It's now known as the, as the, as the Howie roundabout, and he'll show us the monument very shortly. But this was a crossroad. This is, the, this is where, I'll show you on a map in a, just a, in a second. Uh, there's the stuff, same map again I was using earlier on. So if you see where it says SEM there, that's short for cemetery. That's where Mag and Duncan are. So they came in down this way, down the D6. And then they are, Duncan has carried on down to this. You can see on this map, it's a crossroads and now it is a roundabout. So you've got the road going this way off to, to, uh, to the, to the, east and then the roads went to the west then you got the road going south of torini and the road coming in from Isigny. and so this is where the, the kind of fire battle took place as you as it were for san lo and I'll, I'll i'll show a couple of photos well a photo of that area as it was at the time and you'll know this photo when you see it. there's lots of them available on on youtube and on the internet but this is um this is where duncan is it just, it's, it's hard to you know there's the, that one building in the back is possibly still there, but people debate which one it is. And these are a couple of the Wolverines knocked out. And this is elements of the of the one fifteenth. And this this restaurant here, the cafe, is 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 one of the buildings that was used as a headquarters where Major Johns was. And then he removes his headquarters from there to the mausoleum we just talked about because of the intense fire the Germans were 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 firing upon this crossroads. And 
it's that kind of, as Joe was saying in the earlier show, this is the wounded animal kind of biting back. The Germans are going to lose the city of saint Lo now. There's no question about it. There's too many forces coming at them from multiple directions. But while the beast has still got some life, they're still determined to try and hold out as best they can. And so you've still got some, some you know, combat here in the city. But And I'm sure if you're fighting down here, it didn't feel that the battle was over. And you can see all the spent cases there on the side of the road being injected from the from the tank destroyers. And there's holes through the buildings here and holes in the buildings there. And and as Duncan now can see this, it's, you know, it's a it's an unrecognizable now. It's a it's a modern entry to a modern town. And there's very little to really see in terms of what it was like back 76 years ago. But what we do have, of course, is the monument to Major Thomas Howey, who we began talking about in the earlier show. And we'll talk about it again. Duncan's on his way over there now. And Mag, I think, is going to be heading off to her next stop. So um I'll, I'll show a photo of Major Howie and we'll talk about him. And Joe talked about him. So he was a great friend of Major Bingham. He'd taken command of 3rd Battalion, uh, 116th, and, and was, was tragically killed the day before the liberation of San Lo. And he, you can find on the internet, on YouTube, the letter he wrote to his young daughter, Sally, who was six years old. It's very moving what he was saying about why he was going to war. I won't fill it up this show with that. You can find that elsewhere. I'll just show a photo of 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 Harry with his with his daughter. In fact, I'll just get that for, you. and then we'll have Karine talk a little bit about um, uh, about his, the, the monument. So there's there's Major Harry with Sally. So this was been would have been about the last time she ever saw her father. And um, he was, as Joe said earlier, he was a football coach. He was an English teacher. He was Stanton Military Academy. He'd been a graduate of the Citadel, and there's still a Howie Bell Tower at the Citadel today. Seven, you know, seven all these years later. So that's Major Harry there. And um, the monument was moved there. It wasn't there on that roundabout originally, Karine. Explain where, because okay. you're, you're the expert on this, and you can talk about the trees and the monument, and I'll hand over to you. Well, it was originally only the bust, and it was uh, close to the church Sainte Croix, on the rubble of which he was, uh, his body was um, put by his men on the order of Geralt. And uh, then it was moved to here, to this roundabout in night. Well, I'm not sure it was already a roundabout. It became a roundabout after, but it was put here at this uh, at this sector of Saint Lo in 1969. And he uh, is famous uh, for people who are getting interested in the history of the Battle of Normandy and America. But he's very famous in Normandy too, because for the people of Normandy, is the major of Saint Lo as he was named at the time because of the secrecy, they could not reveal who he was, but there had been so many pictures of the, the body of how he wrapped in the American flag on the ruins of the Church Saint Croix that it became very famous, of course. So uh, it's quite a, a nice monument. Uh, the bust is a copy of another similar monument which was built at the Stanton Military Academy in 1947. The copy of the bust here in Saint Lo was put in 1948. And then uh, the American flag put uh, behind the monument is more recent, as we said, uh, when it was moved to, uh, to this place in 1969. On each side of the monument, there is a palmetto tree. Uh, yeah, as you can see. And uh, I did a tour last year with uh, someone who had gone to um, uh, the Citadel, um, which was the college in um, South Carolina, uh, where Major Howie had gone when he was studying. And uh, then he explained to me the palmetto tree um, uh, is the symbol of uh, South Carolina because of an old battle um, against uh, British uh, when uh, the Americans were fighting in the Independence War. Um, they were uh, on an island and they had no wood and uh, they built a fort with palmetto tree logs, palmetto logs, and it revealed itself to be a good idea, although they thought it was not going to be very solid. But when the British attacked with um, uh, cannonballs, um, as the, the palmetto logs were rather soft, it absorbed uh, the impact. So uh, they were, it was part of the reasons why they were able to win this battle. Yeah. And we've got, we've got a, we've got Tom Colon is watching who is 
from South Carolina. So he's, I'm for sure, watching, gleefully rubbing his hands together, all the mention of his state, South Carolina. And he comes to Harry's Monument every year. And he, he he's he's recorded shows for his, he's a TV uh, cameraman about Major Harry. So he's a big fan of what, of what Tom Harry achieved. And it's a lovely monument, you have to say, of all the many hundreds of monuments in Normandy. Some are, some are okay, some are beautiful, some are a bit incorrect. It's a, it's a, a very wonderful design monument. And because it's on the main roundabout, of course, everybody who arrives in the city gets to see it. it, 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 it so it's, perhaps they don't always stop and look at it, but they certainly get to see it. And you can see, of course, because we are doing this 76 years on, that uh, of course, all the wreaths have been laid there here today. So I said this in some earlier shows uh, that, you know, just because we have this awful COVID-19, don't think the people of Normandy have forgotten to honour their liberators and there are still the wreaths and flags and crosses in the British cemeteries and the villages and towns and Canadians. And so here in San Lo, it's all about honouring Major Harry, not because we're identifying Major Harry as being more important than all the other men who fell in the battle, but just because he became a symbol uh, as Joe was saying in the earlier show, he was a very compassionate guy. He led, he led by example. He wasn't a shouter. He wasn't a disciplinarian. He was a gentle soul, and it seemed fitting that his he became the symbol of of um, of, of of the victory and the liberation of the town. So that's a, a wonderful monument. And Duncan will head off back now to his next stop. And Mag, I think, is already in place at our next stop. So uh, it's all very going very very slickly and and professionally today. It's almost like we rehearsed this, and we we did, in fact. So there we go. So so Mag is now a little bit further into the city. I'll show you on the map again where Mag has moved on to. So you can see um, uh, there's the crossroads again, and she's a little bit further over this way now. Just it's not marked on its map, but it's the L'Église Saint Croix, the, the the Holy Cross Church, one of two kind of churches in the middle of the city. And as Karim was saying, there's lots of references to abbeys and monasteries because it was a very religious well it, it, to some extent still is a kind of a religious center and the 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 church where mag is and i'll put mag's camera on is is where uh major howie's body was laid for for some time as he was brought down on the hood of this jeep uh, church damaged in the battle but hadn't been completely destroyed and uh, while Mag is showing some footage of the outsiders and Duncan will be catching her up soon and we'll, we'll maybe try and film inside the church as well if it's still open. I'll, I'll show you and you, those watching this, you know, you know, these photos. These were famously printed in an edition of Life magazine and uh, how his body was laid on the rubble. And you can see, see where the, the join that goes through the plaque there. You can see where the stonework of the church, is, the, the patch, you can see the patch there in it. And when you see the photos, you'll see exactly where these photos are taken. I'll bring them up right now for you. So, so here is, well, the same view. That's what we'd have been looking at if we were here 76 years ago. You'd see Major Howie's Stars and Stripes um, covered body there lying on the rubble of the church. And um, these, were, these were very famous photos that summer when they were, came out. This, this was a, these were symbolic of um, the struggle for Normandy and um, there is Major Howie with Sally again. And these are the ceremonies that took place earlier today. This is uh, Duncan and Mag and Francois are able to witness this. And there's the French veterans there. And obviously there's social distancing being um, followed this year. So not as attended as in previous years, but they're still there. They're still doing their uh, homage to, to Major Harry as, as a symbol. And I'll bring the other photos up as well. There's the, there's the flowers there. So that's from the uh, the Préfet de la Manche, so the the, the the department kind of government and the, and the mayor of the, the town of San Lo there and the Conseil, uh, sorry, the, the, the American embassy kind of involved as well, the, the Conseil des états unis so that everybody's involved in that. And I'll show the photos again. There's, there's three in this series. This is, you can clearly see, there's the, uh, there's the, the gap in the church and there's Harry's body there. And I'll have Mag show us that arch window to the right in a second. And these are just gloriously um, detailed photos taken by a photographer 76 years ago. And then I'll bring the other one up and, um, and then we can, we can, we'll have Kareen talk again. So I'll just find the other photo. Well, here, here's the church. This was taken probably a couple of days later. Um, and you can see it's not been completely destroyed. It's been heavily damaged, but not, not absolutely destroyed um, as, as some of the other rest of the city was. And I've got one more photo to show you which is my, if you can have a favorite photo of something so sad as a guy's death, I don't know whether it's appropriate to have a favorite photo, but the one I think is the most poignant is you've got a 30 cal 
Browning machine gun team there set up in the crater. And you can see how deep the crater is there by by this guy's head over to the left at the bottom there, who's you know, who's you know, six feet below the surface of the of the of the of the road there, effectively. And um yeah, so there there is there is where Major Harry was laid. And there, there are stories of of hundreds of GIs filing past Major Harry's body, especially the men from his battalion, third battalion, 116, but other members members of the division and, and giving an eyes right and saluting this this symbol of the struggle they have spent six weeks, don't forget, to uh, to battle their way there. And as Joe said, 1,800 members of the division, the 29th Division, have lost their lives between Omaha Beach and the San Lo. And we'll we talk about the 35th Division a little bit later on, although we don't have a Joe Balkowski for the 35th, or at least I don't know one who can give us their, their division equal equal fame. But, well, there's Mag, there's the steps. And I think, Mag, and, and well, there's Duncan, I'll get Duncan's view in as well. There's Duncan giving us an overall view of the church there. And so there's still the American flag still fly or, or uh, uh, presented above the plaque to Major Harry. So it's still still um, an important monument for the people of the town. So how old is this church, Karine? I'll bring you in. Well, the church is dating back to the 11th, 12th century, but it has been very heavily restored um, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the, the place where the body of Major Howie had been uh, put uh, was used to be the bell tower that had been built in the 19th century. And um, that's why after the war, when they rebuilt the bell tower, uh, because it was not part of the original construction of the Romanesque uh, church, they put a new uh, bell tower outside of the building and it's a concrete, a modern concrete construction. So yeah, perhaps one that, of them can show the, the tower now. And with the, we, we can't go inside the church. There's actually a mass taking place. So we're not going to disturb a ceremony there. So there, there's not a lot to see inside the church. We just thought we might pop in there if, if we were available, but we can't. So, but there is a modern bell tower there. Oh, Duncan's got it. There we are. It's like, it's so such slick, this team, the dream team. There we are. So it's frankly not the most attractive tower in the world. I think there are other buildings in Normandy that are a little bit more pleasing on the eye than the modern bell tower. But nevertheless... Um, it, it sits there now, just to the side of the original building there. So I think we could, uh, we can all remark, we will be able to remark together by uh, watching the rest of the city later that um, the reconstruction of Saint Lô was not as well done as other cities in Normandy. We were together in Caen the other day, and uh, we could see buildings made in stone with great care. In Saint Lô, the reconstruction was unfortunately not as well done, not as successful. A lot of concrete, grey, sad, and uh, many of the inhabitants of Saint Lô um, uh, were a little bit upset about the way Caen got all of the great things, a uh, lot of money, and then Saint Lô didn't get so much. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of some parts of the East End of London that were rebuilt after war with very lots of concrete, lots of drab. In fact, where the, the London Olympics were, 2012, that part of Stratford was still in concrete and, and, and prefabricated housing, even 60 years after all. And in fact, it was the Olympic Village that finally renovated that part of London to being nice again. And I think you're paying the price a bit for the speed. It's a, it's not that they wanted to build with concrete, and it's because this concrete is efficient and speedy, and the, and this and the and the the need is to get people in homes. The need people is to get people sheltered, and so you're ending up. Well, in fact, if Mag, if 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 Mag shows us a bit to the left there, you'll get an idea. The street over to the left, Mag, of the kind of concrete buildings you get in San Lo. But to you, to your left, Mag. Now the, uh, yeah, that well, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that's the kind of building we're talking about. That um, they they're not. They're okay, but they're, they're, they're serviceable rather than attractive. And I don't mean any offense to people who designed them. I'm just saying that buildings like that, they're, they, you know, they're, they're not going to win any design awards. Whereas perhaps Caen, there's much more use of the original stone. And so there you are. So there's Francois. There's our driver there. Wave to Francois, everybody. He's, he's been driving for us today. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll be moving on soon to our next stop, I think. But we'll talk about the church. I'll just... Um, I can't remember if I've got any other photos of the church or not. I can't remember if I've got another one of the, of the church or not. Saint Croix, I don't think so. Um, no, well, well, I'll just show you again to remind you what that that the, the the photo we showed earlier of the church at the time. 
and you can see so in that photo there that tower behind there you can see the damage there and it's been when it was re, re, refurbished it was kind of simplified slightly i suppose wasn't it less less uh, less um detail than it had been but they're very nice so um I think we're going to be there. The, the camera teams will be moving on to their next spot later on. We'll go and go and head off there and we can carry on talking about the city. And I think it might be a good opportunity to show a couple of the photos of the destruction and talk about just, well, I'll let Karine talk about just how much the city was, was destroyed because we said in the con show, we thought it was something like, was it, was it 50% 50, 50 of con destroyed? I forget what you said now. Well, there's um, I mean, so there's different opinions. I'm exactly of because there's a, a, a study that was done very recently by a, a geograph, you know, uh, who found out that uh, less than I think it's about thirty five percent or thirty eight percent of the buildings have survived in Caen, but uh, it depends. Some people are still telling that it was way more than this and. Uh, uh, was it around 50%, 70%? Anyway, there was uh, in Saint Lo definitely more building destroyed. And um, um, you probably met Jean Mignon, who uh, was yeah. so much involved in the commemorations and making sure that all of this, uh, the sacrifice of American liberators, were, was not forgotten. He used to tell that after the first air bombings, um, it, it to him, who was, I think, 14 years 14, old, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Uh, it was as if there was a big farming machine who had gone through the city uh, digging, you see what I mean, um, a ditch. Uh, and uh, then another uh, wave of bomb planes came later. And, and it was as if uh, the big farming machine had come to dig another ditch across. And um, then I could read you something from a journalist uh, who covered the battle as a war correspondent who came after the battle. But then he, his name was Jacques Kaiser. And then he said, the destruction was total. Only a few isolated buildings here and there are still standing up. It's atrocious and beyond any human sensitivity. Not one civilian. By the time he came, the civilians had all evacuated. Uh, not one shop where we could set up an office, not one house, one could live in. And um, it was, um, the whole traffic goes through two or three ways, opened in the middle of the rubble. saint -Lo does not exist anymore. That was, that's what he, he wrote, wow. and it was very shocking. All of the veterans, American veterans, um, who went through saint -Lo, took pictures, you met them, you, you saw mm. the pictures they took. Even if they came long after the battle, they had pictures of saint -Lo because they were so shocked. So saint -Lo was really part of the most heavily destroyed cities in Europe. Well, that's what Joe said early on. Joe was talking about the veterans didn't even meet any civilians. There were no civilians to meet. They were either dead or gone, and there was they couldn't even see which was roads and which was tracks. And we talked about, <coughs> excuse me, some terrible bombing in Caen. It's... You know, you don't want to belittle the bombing of Caen, but San Lo absolutely was was almost wasted. And when we're, <coughs> excuse me, I'll show some photos of the ruins now, because our next stop, Mag and Duncan are taking us off to uh, a view, one of the few views you can take across the city today that you can actually match up to while the period photos, because the, the horizon has so changed. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I'll, I'll show some of these photos of the ruined city, and you'll see if you've never seen these before. The devastation is just just awful so let me bring up some for you <coughs> so i've got the coughs now suddenly in the middle of a show we'll come back to that one later on actually the, this is what we're talking about we're just talking about uh, you can't tell which is a street you can't tell which is a square a road um just almost complete destruction mm -hmm. and um that's near the river there some color images i'll show some of these images again later on we're not finished i'm just showing for those watching who are not as aware of san lo just how much the city was was almost wasted to nothing there's one there and you know that they might reminiscent of photos of places like Ypres in the first world war and some of the areas up near verdun i mean just 
wanton destruction and the color because all the dust of the buildings you know the, the vehicles are all covered in caked in dust and so are the people going through it so um i think they're getting to where they're going to be next i think we'll have a look at where they are um yep so the, and mag used to live in this street that's one of mag's former houses down somewhere there she might tell us about that later on because we will bring in mag because Although Karin is our expert in terms of Normandy history, one of the most experienced tour guides in Normandy, Mag is from San Lo, so she will add something. And you can see that chimney over there in Mag's shot there. That chimney you see in some of the shots of San Lo as, as one of the surviving, surviving buildings. And across the other side of the valley there, there are a couple of original houses, but really not very many. You'll see all down below it's modern houses. Mag is going to go up the steps of the other well, parts of the castle there and we'll, we'll as best we can we'll match up a view and duncan also will be giving us some sort of panoramas you can see what karine was saying lots of rather square um practical construction rather than rather than pretty although it's prettier now there's some nice ornamental hedges down there so we're we're looking um where are we looking across to karine at that view there that's we're looking across to um uh, the ridge there, which is with that where General Marx's bunker was over there, kind of. Yeah. But, um, well, it's um, we, we're looking to the north, right? Yeah, and, yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, so I'll just have to put on Mag's view. Mag's going up the steps now. This is one of the original parts of the city. You can see this in the ridge, or at least a repaired original wall. And and Mag will just do some shots left and right. And you can see if I'm, I'm sure some of the people watching this have never been to San Lo, and um. You know, we we had we had dinner there two nights ago, and we had our, we did our recce, and it's a, it's a nice enough place. But you mm -hmm. can see there's a lot of modern construction there, and so Mag's going to sort of swing around there, and the building we're looking for, Mag will hold the shot. Is well, tell us about what what building can we see in the background there, Mag? Okay, what you see, the beautiful building at the end. It's a it's a school. It's a private can school. Can you zoom it's a little bit, Mag? No, I can't. Okay. So there's a, just in front of the tree line there in the distance. So there's some trees, it's like two trees kind of pointing. Oh, like a yeah, I can. There we are. Well, that building there, the one with the with the uh, the cutouts there. Well, that's well. Tell yeah. us about the building, Mag. It's called uh, L'Institut, and it's a private school. And I went to that school. Um, and uh, when on the the war pictures, you can see that it was not destroyed. Um, that school, and it was used, of course, by the uh, the German uh, has an aid quarter. Um, so the, the photo we I'll try to interrupt you. I'll bring come back to you. The photo we're talking about is a is a color one, and it's one that the mag kind of things of. So there there is the view as best we can get it. So if you're watching this, the building mag is showing you there is the building there in the background. I'll zoom in. You can see it there. So there is the in, the institute, the institute. So the, that's the school where mag went to school, and you can see just below these are the ramparts here to the left. So mag is on the left, and it's that famous photo of those two kids there in the front, looking down on it as a, as a uh, uh, I think that's a um, staff car and a Jeep going through there. And this is clearly, Karine, this is some weeks later, I think, because they've cleared yes. the rubble off the streets. There's signs up. So this is probably late July or, or maybe even early August because it's still an important junction. The battle is moving to Via and off to Coutances, but saint Lo is still where all the supplies coming from the beaches are coming through San Lo. So it's why whenever we take a veteran who is anywhere, you know, most American veterans will remember going through San Lo at some point because it doesn't matter what unit you're in, the 4th, the 83rd, the, the, the 9th, the 2nd, the 29th, the 1st, at some point, and all, of course, the engineer battalions and the, 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 the tank units, they all kind of went through San Lo. So there... There's the reminding you, there's the institute in the background there. And I'll put back to Mag's view there again. And there we have, you can you can zoom out now, Mag, so we can get, can you kind of show us the road below you a little bit, maybe? See that it's it's hard because everything has changed so much, but that, that Jeep is kind of going, there's a, there's a camper van reversing out into the street. Well, that, and the car, that's kind of going the opposite way. That Jeep and the Plymouth are going to kind of going over that roundabout, that traffic circle sort of heading off. Um, so that's as best we can get a recreation of the view as it is today. And Duncan is also panning around left to right. Um, so there's there's not a lot there. And, and, and Karine, if you want to run through some of this, you know, you've told us that amazing quote there. So is it 82 percent of the town? I mean, it's it's a, it's silly to put a figure because when you were it's telling us a couple of days ago, be, how do you count what's destroyed? Is it, you know, 
Well, 82% is generally what is uh, considered as the, the mass of destruction, the uh, proportion of Saint-Lô destroyed, 82%, yes. Uh, but there were less people killed in Saint-Lô than in Caen. In Caen, it was about 2,000. And in Saint-Lô, between 600 and 800, depending on uh, how you count. I mean, it's still very difficult to count death, of course, because many of them have completely disappeared. But um, it's less than in Caen because of these um, horribly destructive uh, air bombings on June 6, like in Caen, but Saint-Lô being m way further, much further away inland than the beaches where the Allies had landed the people of Caen, many of them decided to stay, although, as I uh, say, most of them had evacuated, but some of them, more than in Saint-Lô, decided to stay because of they thought they would be liberated faster. It's something that everybody uh, who is not from Normandy um, have troubles uh, understanding. Uh, when they evacuated, it was to go where? Nobody could tell them where there was a place, a safe place to go. So in Saint-Lô, they were much further away, so more people evacuated because they thought it was going to take longer. And anyway, the population was not as big as in Caen, so proportionally speaking, it was uh, not far to be the same. And uh, so uh, you can see um, the uh, geography, uh, the geographical feature is interesting because it's not flat at all. And it shows also how difficult it was for fighting for the American forces because you have all of these rocky outcrops. Uh, it goes up and down and up and down again and again. And the old center of Saint Louis itself on a rocky outcrop that was fortified in the Middle Ages by the uh, city wall that you can see remnants of. Um, and um, it's interesting that so many air bombings have destroyed so many buildings. But uh, this street, especially that we can see right now, if um, we had the view from the other side, from the street, from down at the level of the street, we could see the big city wall. But in 1944, before the air bombings, it was just impossible because there were plenty of other buildings um, that were hiding the city wall. And they, the city wall resisted because it was so thick, much uh, more solid than mm. the other constructions. And then it appeared uh, after the destruction of the buildings around. Well, it's that age-old thing that why are Roman buildings from 1500 years ago still surviving, but buildings we built in the 1950s are falling apart. We, mm -hmm. we knew how to build back then, and although they were bombed, it's amazing how much better the old original buildings seem to last because of just brilliant construction techniques and thickness. I mean, just big, thick, thick, eight-foot-wide walls, and they, they seem to survive very well. So... Um, and again, for those who are watching, who are perhaps less, less knowledgeable about the Battle of Normandy, let me show you again that the, um, an image of um, why Saint-Lô is important. I'm just going to find it for you uh, in my other stream because it is a major crossroads town. That is the thing. It is, it is an important, important um, objective because without it, we can't break out. I'll, I'll just get the image ready for you and I'll share it. Hang on, here we go. So there we are. There's a map of of, um, of Normandy there. And that's the sort of situation um, it says there. This is the San Lo break. We're talking about Operation Cobra. So in fact, a few days on. But San Lo sits here. So if you're if you're not so familiar with the Battle of Normandy, the Coten Tan Peninsula goes up here to Cherbourg. So you've got roads coming down this way through the Haye de Puy de Coutons. Well, all those roads end up going this way to the to the east through San Lo. Um, the roads south go to Vildieu and Vier. The roads to the east go off to Comor and eventually Falaise and Caen and uh, Argenton. And, and so Saint-Lô is this incredibly important junction. And, 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 the, and, the, and Joe said in the earlier show, the terrain starts to change when you go further south. You start losing the bocage and, and things change a bit. So we couldn't go around Saint-Lô because the road network went through Saint-Lô. It would have been much easier to bypass it somehow, but you can't bypass it. There's marshes over here. There's forest over here. The ground isn't suitable. So we just absolutely had to take Saint-Lô. And that's why um, we, we, we were spending six weeks trying to take it. So... Um, Big, big, important objective, and 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 the, the poor vi vi villagers of San Lo paid heavily for with the for the, the price of of that battle by the fact their city was almost destroyed. So they're heading off to a next location next, which is another church, 
uh, the Notre Dame, the L'Eglise de Notre Dame, where every a lot of it, south towns and cities in France have a Notre Dame or Notre Dame, Notre Dame, as you Americans would say. Mm -hmm. Most famously, there's one in Paris, of course, um, and it's another church that 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 was heavily hit, and there's modern the modern prefecture of of Le Mans there, and so. Um, uh they're gonna come up and there's some cool things we're gonna show you around the church there they're just walking their way to there at the, at the moment so kareen any more history about the bombing you want to share while the two the, the camera people are walking well you, it's uh, it's always the same stories of being so scared the civilians tried to get refuged in shelters some of them had the luck to have a cellar and uh, there were several families going together in cellars or in different um, houses that they thought would be safe enough. And then how scared they were for such a long time uh, for the American soldiers who were progressing with troubles in the Bocage. It was 44 long days of suffering, fighting in hard conditions. But for the people of Saint-Lô, it was the same, 44 days of trying to survive. Many of them had evacuated after the air bombings of June the 6th and June the 7th. Only the wounded people and some families uh, who didn't want to leave their houses uh, stayed. So the city was rather empty with, when the Americans arrived. But think about the people uh, under the air bombings, how scared they were. And when they evacuated, more air bombings started and um, they were going the uh, same way that Americans went later on because there was no other road. As I just said, and most of them kept being pushed by the battle. So they evacuated to get sheltered in a town further south, but then the battle followed them and more air bombings, more fighting, and they went again so they could only transport a few things inside um, suitcases and carrying their children in the arms and living in the farm here or sleeping in a ditch there. Every day they had to get out to find food. And for the people who stayed in the city, it was um, uh, air bombings again and again and again. Uh, well, uh, and then the, the final battle. So you can see the, the church here. Well, so here's the, church the original that, church. Um, I'll, 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 and there's an interesting story. In yeah. I learned stuff from Karine on the recce two days ago because you'll see in the photos in the war that there's kind of the, 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 diff, the damage to spires didn't all happen at the same time. And Karine will go through. But there's the original, I guess, the photo was taken in the 1920s, something like that. So that is the, the original church. Very, I mean, Karine can tell us about its style there. So it's it's a it's a very to me it reminds me of the one in Paris. It's very similar in, in the in the style. So Karine, tell us about its 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 architectural um, style. Well, most of it is from the 13th century, uh, and uh, there were some transformation in the 14th and the 15th century, and. Um, it was uh, named often the cathedral by the people of Saint-Lô, although it was not a cathedral, but it was owned by the Bishop of Coutances because the cathedral was in Coutances and it was the Bishop of Coutances who owned, uh, he was the Baron of Saint-Lô. And uh, yes, when you see uh, what is remaining now, uh, it's interesting because of in Normandy in general, uh, um, all of the churches that were already historical monuments had to be restored and were restored to look like what they were before the war. But in so here's a view of it, and you can see the castle ramparts there, and you see there's one tower. So this was taken, I think, quite soon after liberation, maybe maybe 76 years ago today, but maybe maybe a couple of days later. You can see there's one tower, you know, the tower up, but then later even that spire goes. So so who hit that spire, Karin? Well, it was um, the Germans because after Sella was. Uh, had been liberated by the Americans, uh, Saint-Lô was uh, shelled by the Germans who were on the hills uh, further south. And uh, uh, the, the towers um, had not been so badly damaged. Um, and there was, uh, what I don't know his name, but there were some Americans who went to the top of the tower to set up uh, telephone cables or radio set, I don't remember. And right after uh, he came down, uh, the Germans shelled and then the spire collapsed. So uh, 
Yeah, yeah I read that story earlier. So it's all in Joe Barkovsky's wonderful book, Beyond the Beachhead. And they went up there, had a good view, realized there was an amazing view from that tower there, came down. As Karine said, they decided they were going to set up a proper communications up there. But before they could get the proper, and the last bit, they had to kind of scale by kind of using a rope, like, yeah. a, like a grappling hook. But by the time they went back to put a proper observation position up there, it had been knocked down by the Germans. You can see a, a tank. I love the name of that tank. It's called the Hun Chaser. They are there for Sherman tank sitting there in the rubble. Again, you can see the freshness of the rubble tells us that that photo is sooner than the one of the, the mag showed us of the Jeep and the car going through San Lo when the roads have been cleared. So you can see there, there's one tower visible. Now here's another photo. So bear with me. I'm going to find the next one. And Mag's getting bored standing in the one place there. But here's another couple of other photos. So there you can see the tower's gone again now. So it's, um, it's um, yeah, well, the, the spire has gone. The tower's still there. And that's the very view Mag has got. So you can see the two people there are standing. And you can see all the buildings to the side are just gone. And there's just a shell of a building on the left and a massive great pile of rubble. I'll get back to Mag's view again. So there's bang on the exact view there. That's what we're trying to do here at World War II TV. Oh, it was um, Joe Belkowski's giving us the names of the two officers. It was left Lieutenant Colonel John P. Cooper of the 110th Field Artillery Bat uh, Battalion and Captain Eli Gifford of the 227th Field Artillery Bat Battalion. So there we are, the absolute information there. So there, I'll show you the other photo. There's another one. It's a, 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 a color one, in fact. And there, and that's, a, that's maybe a little bit later because I think the rubble's been a little bit swept up it's hard to say it's a little bit of the loose bits but there's a color shot of that same view and um so yeah hit by the americans then hit by the germans and then of course ultimately a lot of these buildings would have to be kind of the ones that are, like that house there at the left there's not enough there to rebuild so that would have to have been pulled down and then rebuilt and just dealing with the amount of rubble and masonry dust would have been ter terrible and i remember reading account of uh, the the workers having to wear masks over there appropriate talking about masks in the middle of 2020 because of the dust from the city there so there's that same church and there again is mag's same view of it today and duncan i think is walking around the side of the church for us now and on and, the picture on the on the view sorry right now you can see the reconstruction so so is the only place where uh, the architect in chief of the historical monuments of france uh, decided to not restore the facade as it was done for all of the other churches. The city council did not agree with this decision. They wanted the church to be rebuilt, to be restored. They wanted the, the scars of the war to be erased, but uh, there was like, um, you know, a, a, a battle. I mean, they were not fighting in reality, but they did not agree with each other. And it took a long time. And finally the city council gave up and said, okay, do what you want. And the architect in chief, Roi de Vaux, wanted to just put a bandage on the facade of the church rather than to restore because he wanted to make it become a, a, a monument, a memorial to the destruction of Saint-Lô. But the people of Saint-Lô uh, at the time were not so happy with this. So it's green shale, which is um, real stone coming from the area. Uh, there are lots of green shale stone quarries in uh, the Cotentin area. Um, that was used to fill in the gap uh, where there used to be the, the facade of the church. So very sad, very... Um... Joe is saying, I think, because Joe is watching this show, that the, the when Cooper was in the spy, it was actually shaking and, uh, severely when he was in it. So it was obviously unstable when he was up it. And you can imagine, clearly, it's unstable. And on that subject, here is Duncan again, Mr. Bullet Holes, showing us some of the, the in incredible amount of shrapnel damage and um and, and bullet hits on it and there's something very special i'm hoping some people watching this i know some have been to san lo but i'm sure some of you haven't been to san lo so my question to you viewers is do you like churches do you like bombs do you like bombs and churches would you like to see a bomb in a church so just around the corner there is actually a, a shell um, embedded in a wall, and Duncan will bring us that very shortly. Mag is still showing us the outside there. And if you haven't been to San Lo, this is one of those incredible little souvenirs and scars of the battle you can see. So there it is. So there's a Duncan will point out the banding on the shell there. So the fuse and the nose of the church, the shell is embedded in the wall of the church. And that's the, the rear half of the shell. Obviously, all the exposure has been taken out there. It's completely safe now. And I'm hoping some people are watching this didn't know that was there. And it's, it's kind of not on the side of the church 
you'd necessarily walk around unless you're particularly going around that way. You'd come at it from the other direction. If you're coming from the main square, the way Mag and Duncan have come at it is they've come at it from the side you wouldn't necessarily come at. But um, they, that, that's an amazing bit of um, uh, souvenir. The one There's the green shale uh, that, that Kareem was talking about. This the bandage the, uh, that, that they, they didn't want to repair the church. They wanted to heal the church, if you like. So that hence the use of the bandage. And I'll put on, that's an amazing relic there. I'm hoping some people, yes, I've got a bloody hell there from one of the viewers. James Broom went bloody hell. So there we are. That's the kind of reaction we want. This is what we're bringing you on World War II TV. New stuff you haven't seen before. We're not just regurgitating all the same old black and white footage. We're taking these battlefields live 76 years on. So, and there's Mag showing us a view again. I, I kind of like that mixture of the old style there. And the rebuilt there, it's kind of showing that you know the old town is still there, but yet it's been rebuilt with a more modern, modern idea. So pretty cool stuff there. And um, there's also a very charming World War One monument that I think one of the camera people is going to be walking us to, or both of them are walking us to very shortly. So that'll be quite nice to see. And um, <coughs> this is kind of a part of the town. We're quite near the main street now. I hope Duncan doesn't get run over crossing the road. I think he's okay. So there, yeah, you can see the mixture of the styles. There's some modern the shale to rebuild it and the original stone there. So there's Mag showing us some of the same, the same bullet holes that 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 that, Mag, that Duncan showed us earlier. So Duncan is now at the monument. And um Karik, so Kareem, we're, we're gonna go, we'll talk about World War One for a minute or the first world war. We I know this is World War Two TV, but and we'll show you the reason we're showing this money because it's damaged from the war. I mean, Duncan, in fact, um, Duncan is going to show us that the uh, the damage there. Duncan, talk to us for a minute there. What are you What are you showing us? Basically, this is uh, shrapnel and uh, bullets that have actually gone through. As you can see, this is an absolute superb one. Let me just show you this. So there we go. So, yeah, you can see the in and the out there. So the this, in and the this, out there. So this statue Look was on that. a was on a stone plinth at the time, but you know, probably obviously put up after the First World War. But it's now been lowered to just be kind of on on street level. But we can still see the so, so uh, the irony of a World War One statue being damaged in World War Two. But Kareen, just briefly tell us about the system because there was a series of standard designs towns and villages could choose from there's like a catalog of statues and it's so that's why you see the same statue quite often but well, this, this one is quite unusual but some of them you see the same one and obviously the more the more complicated the sculpture the more expensive they were yeah. and i'm guessing this is quite it but do for those watching if you can show on the face duncan we kind of think he looks a bit like sylvester stallone we're not in any way belittling the, the, the French sold there, but do you think there's a bit of an Adrian like in Rocky there? I think so. I think there's a bit of Sly Stallone going on there. It's the, the, the mouth. But anyway, that may just be us. So, Karine, tell us about these designs they could choose from. Well, after World War I, um, every town of France who had lost so many men wanted its monument. And uh, in certain cities, they are really, um, you know, more like pacifists. Uh, war is a bad thing, and um, sometimes it's more being combative, you know, uh, to honor the bravery, uh, uh, tenacity of soldiers. This one, as you say, used to be on a pedestal, and at the foot of the pedestal there was a woman, a sculpture of a woman in, uh, in bronze as well, uh, crying. And the sculpture of the woman is now in the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Saint-Lô, because it was also damaged. Uh, during the Battle of Saint Lô, so uh, uh, they they um, they left um, the soldier that you are showing right now, which was in better shape outside, and the uh, other the woman is inside the museum. Uh, and uh, so, in every French town, even the smallest, you would have a monument to World War One, and they are very different. And uh, in Saint Lô, uh, the cemetery where we started the the tour earlier, there's quite a big um, area. Uh, dedicated to the men of Salo who died as soldiers of World War One, so mm. uh, it was a big sacrifice for the city. So Maggie's now. In, 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 we'll let Dun Duncan like showing us bullet holes, but he Duncan, you can you can carry on if you want. But I think we've done enough, and we do get Neil Morgan, whose father 
David Morgan was an I Company 506, so another another son of a veteran, although albeit airborne is watching. And he said, yeah, he thought it looked like Sylvester Stallone as well. So I'm not the only one. So we'll talk. We'll, we'll show the monuments in a minute. In a minute, Mag. We'll just we'll just talk genuinely about this. If you just kind of pan around the square, both of you, for those who've never been here, I want to get the idea that this is a very modern city. Well, not well, yeah, but kind of a modern, open plan um, kind of Euro star with with lots of these not terribly attractive kind of concrete apartment buildings, but. Yeah, there's some money. There's a there's a, there's a very famous Arara, a horse stud in San Lo that brought some money to the city. And is that there's but um, it's Saturday evening now. And if it were a market day, this square would be bustling and full of people. And and I'll show you again. I'll go through the city, the photos of the of the city in ruins just to remind you again of just the devastation of this city. Um, because you know, if you haven't seen these photos before, the, the as Karine is saying, for this these poor people, their city and their homes were almost entirely destroyed. It's not just their homes; it means their power, their electricity, their water, uh, the the sewage, the 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 places of worship, hospitals. Everything has to be rebuilt. And there's this whole series of photos. I'll, I'll go through a couple of them with you there, just to to to, to give you an idea of. of um, I'll get another one up for you um there we are there's there's the city again and um there's a couple of civilians walking through there and you know we're difficult to find food for the first few weeks after the invasion obviously the americans are coming through but you know the americans have a battle to win the british we've got to keep on pushing we can't necessarily keep stopping and we do we would set up civil affairs departments to help the french out to help rehome people help get or uh, amenities back on we try and get people set up and and, and get mayors in place and people who could advise civilians and refugees what to do and where to, to go. And an interesting thing, I, I, a little bit of trivia I found, if you, obviously all of these cities and towns like Caen, the Germans had offices here as well, of course. They, they, their headquarters are in saint Lo and Caen, so they'd had places where the French had to register for rations and this, that and the other. And in these civil affairs offices that were set up in places like Caen and saint Lo and Villa Bocage, the American military personnel and British military personnel tried very hard to not look look too military. They were they wore open. They had they had they took their helmets off and had kind of open collars, and they tried to not wear their pistol belts all the time because they wanted to give the French the idea that we are we're not a military oppressive occupying um, army. We are here to help. So there was lots of first names. If you were a French civilian going into the civil affairs office in Saint Lo in August. The American military personnel would often often call each other Bob and Fred and Paul and Joe because they didn't want to be saluting each other all the time because that's how the Germans were, and they were trying to give this idea that no, you're a friend, come in and how here's how to get some um, uh, uh, rations, here's how to find out where. So, so Mag, do you want to do you want to talk a bit? You're the San Lo girl, so come come and join in, Mag. Give us some give us some give us some words. Well, do you want to talk where we're standing right now? Go for it, yeah. No, go for it. Well, it's uh, the old um, um, jail, and it's uh, they kept part of it. It became a memorial against the uh, Nazi uh, repression. So, so Karine will give us some more idea. But this was part of a very large prison, wasn't it, Karine? That was yeah. here from from for, for, for a long time it before the been, war, and was hit on been, June the sixth. That's that same bombing raid we talked about earlier. Um, Absolutely, yes. And so Mag will go and show us the names. Show us, go, walk up and show us the names if you could, please, Mag. So the prison was built in 1824. And yes, as you said, it was destroyed by the air bombings during the night between June the 6th and the 7th. Uh, many prisoners, from what I read, had been liberated earlier. All of the prisoners inside the prison who had done things that were not too serious. So as a consequence, most of the prisoners who were left inside the prison when the air bombings happened were resistance members because of the Germans were not going to liberate the resistance members. There were 150 men inside the prison when the air bombings happened. And uh, uh, it was 46 of them who were killed, 46 men, including 33 resistance members. And uh, so you can see... Um, names um, of other people, other resistance members uh, who had been 
captured and executed or killed in different circumstances before and even after. Uh, there are also names from uh, families who were uh, deported uh, as Jewish people or um, people who had helped Jewish people, because when you were helping Jewish people, you were considered like them and had the same punishment. Um, so this, um, it used to be the door of the prison and uh, it was transformed to become, a, uh, well, it was preserved more exactly. Uh, what is remaining from the pri prison was uh, becoming a monument to the resistance members and the people who were deported. So here, right now we can read uh, in French, enfant, Mielinti, uh, two of them. So enfant means chi children, child. And uh, of course, for the Jewish families who were deported, uh, it was parents and children. And, uh, the Nazis were not making a difference between uh, mm. uh, adults. Well, I want to, Mag showed us, could you show us the Zucker name again, Mag? Because that's, that's a story that Mag knows about. Because Mag's father, Bernard, who was from um, uh, Emonville, which is the, Three, two or three miles away from San Meriglise. The Zoukers are listed on the monument in Emonville there as well, because they were a Jewish uh, family. We think they were traders in Cherbourg and they were taken, I think it was something like 140 Jews were taken out of Normandy. It, was, it wasn't a massive number because there wasn't a massive Jewish population. It wasn't like Warsaw or even Paris, which has a huge, and, and has a huge Jewish quarter. The Marais in Paris is still a traditionally Jewish area. But those that were taken away, and if you ever go to somewhere like the Holocaust Monument in DC or the Holocaust Museum in Paris, the Zoukers names are on those lists because they are some of the families that were taken off and, and, and killed at, I, I think it was Auschwitz in their case. So, so Norman didn't have a massive population of Jews, but those that were, were taken away. And I think only about four or five of the 140 ever came back. I think they had a very bad um, percentage that were lost. And we always get as Normandy tour guides, particularly the French guys like Mag and Karine and Francois, who's driving, not less so me and Duncan, because they know we're British, but the French always get asked about what was the resistance doing and what was going on in France and occupation. And of course, in Normandy in general, in general, the resistance was here to provide information for the Allies. It wasn't an area where the French resistance was going up and blowing things up every day. That's happening elsewhere in France, Brittany. Uh, I'd love to do some shows from uh, Brittany sometime in the future because Brittany was there was large scale battles between the resistance and the SS and the Germans and their core further south in France, big battles between the resistance and the and the and, and the Germans. But in Normandy, it's a small resistance, a very important resistance, but they're gathering information that is used. The maps, the officers in the 29th Division used, the officers' maps, like my great uncle used, some of that information came from the brave Makizad, the FFE guys who had been, been going out and cycling around and noting down positions of positions and troops and troop movements and units and things. And so there's Mag, so it says there to the victims of the Nazis. So you actually have the word Nazi up there on the on the on the wall there. We were saying two years, two days ago, wonder whether how long they'll be allowed to have the word Nazi there, whether the political correctness will be able to take that away. I don't know. Duncan is showing us a different one. I'll just put on Duncan's camera for a second. Duncan is showing the other side there. And you see the Republic Francais, uh, the, the flag and the French flags there. And there's part of the prison wall there. And there's various plaques around there to uh, to resistance fighters and 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 organizations that were involved in in resisting the uh, the german occupation and, and and at some point in the future i want to do a world war ii tv show where we really talk about resistance and collaboration and what is collaboration what's resistance and what's just survival because i think it's a very nuanced subject that deserves some real real discussion about what was happening in the occupied countries and some more bullet holes there because duncan and i have the privilege of coming from a country that was never occupied by the Germans. So we always, we, we were bombed, of course, but we, we didn't have Germans marching down our streets, unlike the people of Holland and German and, and Denmark and Norway and France and Belgium. So it would need to be Europeans talking about. We've got a show on the 24th, mark your calendars, viewers, about Denmark in World War II. I've got four absolutely top Danish historians joining me to, to discuss um, sorry, three, including myself, uh, discussed Denmark in World War II, another country that had some very interesting experiences. So there's the range of the remains of the prison there. And um, we're, we're, we're actually moving through the first show very efficiently, which means I'm very excited because it means we can get to an extra spot that we, we didn't think we were going to take you to. 
but we will have time to go off and drive to a final shop. That actually brings up to the... Um, Oh, I'm being reminded by reminded by Martin that the Channel Islands, of course, were occupied. And yes, of course, I'm 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 mainland UK was not occupied, but the Channel Islands, of course, were occupied. Yes, well, 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 well noted, Martin. I I I should I should have said that clearly. And Jersey, of course, was you know still in German hands for a long time after the liberation of other parts of France. So um, I think we're going to kind of finish up in terms of our camera teams in the centre of Saint Lo now, and they'll have them join Francois in the vehicle. And they're going to drive off and take you to a bonus stop. But um, we were discussing earlier when we had the briefing at lunch whether we would have time to do it. And we didn't oh, think we would, but I think we minutes. will. So uh, I will just Forget mute. About that. Hang on, I'll mute you, Mag. Hang on, you're on screen, Duncan. Stop being, being more professional, please. <laughs> so um, if you want to sum up some more about the bombing, Karim, before they drive off or the San Lo and the reconstruction, because... How long would it have taken a city like San Lo to have been, if you like, back to normal? We're talking about a decade or so, aren't we, really? Ten years, I suppose. More, more than this. More officially, than if it, it, officially, it's 15 years. But when you talk with the people of San Lo, uh, people of the city council who are still doing things now, they tell it is still going on. Uh, as I said earlier, the reconstruction was done in emergency. It was not super great what was done. And we saw that some of the buildings have been um, painted in uh, nice colors. So they are still trying to rebuild the city to let it become a nice place. Um, I told you about how upset they were about the reconstruction. So they are still rebuilding their city. But 15 years to go back to a city where you can really live normally um, but of course impossible to forget and uh, many many families that were uh, you know decimated destroyed and uh, um, we could not see um, during the time um, our friends were moving the, the flag of Saint Lo the flag of Saint Lo is um, like the coat of arms but it was read on rather recently and there's a unicorn that is the emblem of Saint Lo since the 15th century if ever they see a flag, um, it would be interesting to show it because there's an interesting story about the man, uh, the graphist, who designed the modern logo um, with a unicorn. It's a blue flag with a red square up to the left and a unicorn on it. This man was born during the night of the air bombing, the night between June the 6th and June the wow. 7th. And his mother uh, couldn't stay home because of the air bombings, their house was destroyed, so they escaped. But she was going to have her baby. So she took refuge uh, in the hospital of the Bon Sauveur. That was normally for mentally uh, handicapped uh, people. And then she got her baby here. But then air bombing started again. And the hospital was being under it. So they had to escape. And the nuns told her, uh, go away, go away. Um, the baby would become an angel. He will not suffer. And she left her baby uh, to go and try to get sheltered in a better place. But another nun uh, got concerned about the baby. So she wrapped the baby in a cover and ran away uh, on time to save the baby. The family had been separated, but because of a cover that had been brought by the uh, mother uh, to get her baby, she had planned to wrap the baby in this cover. Later, um, she recognized the cover and found the baby inside. And it was 76 years ago. And this man later uh, became a graphist and made the logo of Saint Lo. So quite an uh, interesting story. And he was born during the night of June, between June the 6th and June the 7th. And his, uh, he had a brother who was 19 years old, who was part of the resistance and who was killed uh, doing some, uh, um, you know, spying German positions to inform the Allies in August 1944. And he said, I, I was born at this time and my brother died at the same time. Oh, not wow. the same day, but same battle. Well, this isn't the bonus stop. This is the, the, the bonus stop is still to come. This is a, just a planned stop. And um, alas, unless anyone's watching who is an expert on the 35th Division, I do not know an expert in the 35th Division, which is a shame because they are the unit over to the... I'll show you the map again. I'll share the map from earlier. So we've been talking about the 29th Division coming in this way from the east. The 35th came in from more sort of north 
and uh, and there's their regiments, the one the one thirty fourth coming in, and they are equally the liberators of San Lo. I just I don't have a thirty fifth division, Joe Balkovsky, unfortunately. If I if I if you know any who can do a future show, but again we want to acknowledge the fact that the. Uh, there's been wreaths laid there, the other division. And I'm afraid one of my only references, my own personal reference to the 35th division, of course, that's the unit depicted by uh, in Kelly's Heroes, Clint Eastwood and Telly Savalis, and all those guys are 35th division when they're fighting in, in Nancy, Nancy, as they say, or Nancy. Yes. So the 35th division are also included there. And Maggie's going to show us the other monument, and then we'll fit in this bonus stop that I'm going get, to get you to that you'll find quite interesting. So there's the 35th division there. So that's what we've covered today. If you've been watching this show, folks, we covered from the 11th of July to the 18th of July. So that's the week of the actual battle for San Lo. The previous five weeks had been the ground between Omaha Beach and the San Lo. And there, because now Duncan is now almost directly below where we were earlier, uh, looking out across the city there. And as Karine said, you know, for whatever reason, the original... Um, rampart walls survived as you can see pretty damn well they uh they 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 were in good shape built built well i think it's fair to say so we'll get bring mag's view in now and then we'll go off and do our bonus so mag there's there's the um the the, the as kareen said the rocky outcrop that the san lo chateau is built on top of and there's a very lovely monument there that mag is just working away across the road without being run over that sits on the side of the stone um talking about the, the city and its destruction then we'll go off to the, the to our final our final extra bonus stop so there's the, the part of the, the castell the tower of the, of the castle there to survive well patched up and mag just making a way across don't get run over mag we don't we don't want to lose you there's been enough loss of civilians in san lo so um Mag is taking us up to the other monument. Duncan, I think, is working his way back to the van now so they can carry on this last stop. So there we are. So it says, to the, the memory of the victims of the uh, the, the bombardments and the Battle of San Lo. And there, uh, can we, is there a flag near there with the unicorn on it somewhere, Mag? We, oh, no, there we have. No, that's the that's not the unicorn there. Is that the unicorn there on the front? No, car? because the flag I'm talking about is blue. Yeah, it's not. It's not the French flag or the Normandy flag. They're the two leopards. Is there a unicorn you can see from there anywhere near you, Mag? Blue and yellow above. On my Hang on, screen. Duncan's got it. Duncan's got it. No, no, that's not the unicorn one. No. no. Keep <laughs> going. We'll try. But anyway, Mag, what, what, so what does it feel like for you being part of this show? You know, you're the San Go, San Lo girl. Are you, are you proud to be part of something? Um, you know, giving a bit of a honoring your, your, your town. Yeah, I'm extremely proud. I'm not, well, I was born here, but as you know, my family is from uh, um, Utah Beach area. Um, but no, I'm extremely proud. I'm, I'm facing the uh, sort of the memorial for the victims. And we can also see uh, the two, uh, you know, uh, Médaille d'honneur that uh, the Légion uh, d'honneur. Légion d'honneur and Croix de Guerre yes. that uh, the Saint Louis City got um, by the, the French president few years after after the war and the there's, a, there's another memorial here oh yes and Karine's gonna tell us about that Karine's so that, that's the so what what are you seeing Mag? then I'll have Karine explain so so it says uh, to honor the uh, 13,632 uh, civilians of um, Normandy, well, low Normandy, you know, Bass Normandy, this uh, this part of Normandy. That, that's not the part that includes, um, that, that that doesn't include La Havre, does it? Exactly, no, no. yeah. So that's why when we've been talking about the losses in Normandy, there's, there, there, now it's Normandy is one place. There was uh, Bass Normandy, so lower Normandy and Haute Normandy, higher Normandy, and, and, and now it's been re reunited as one region of France. But there is still some debate about the number of losses in the whole of Normandy, but that's the, and in, tell us about what's inside that monument, Karin. So it's actually something that is um, more recent, but it could not find, uh, it could not find exactly the year when it was dedicated, inaugurated. So they put a capsule inside which they are the names of all of the 13,632 civilians who were killed in uh, Calvados, La Manche, and Lom uh, areas, which is considered like Basse Normandy, Lower Normandy. En fait, uh, Duncan, he's here. 
And I find it very, you know, it's, it's incredible that um, they, they managed to uh, get uh, this. I mean, the soldiers, it would be great if we had this, the names of all of the British, American, Canadian fighters who fought in Normandy. Um, especially when we do tours, it would be great for us to be able to answer families, you know, when they come in the footsteps of their fathers or grandfathers, uh, where, you know, we know him. But at least here um, in Salo, they did. Um, and they put the names of all of the civilians, men, women and children, who were killed uh, in Lower Normandy inside this capsule, which is inside the stone that Magali showed us a few minutes ago. And uh, so um, here you can see uh, the monument on the rock and uh, down to the left, uh, there's the entrance of the um, underground shelter that the Germans had built during the occupation. And uh, on June the 6th, in the evening, when the air bombing started, um, they, the civilians escaped from their houses before the next air bombing would start. And all of them rushed to go to the underground. And uh, the Germans, uh, at first, did not accept any civilian to go. But finally, after uh, some time, uh, they let civilians get in. I think they took mostly the wounded people. It was not big enough for everybody. And uh, they were about 1,000 people of Saint-Lô who survived inside the German shelters under the rock. And uh, um, many others took refuge in a town a little further outside of Saint-Lô, Le Utrel, uh, where the people over there were spared by air bombings. And uh, they took care of uh, many wounded people who had escaped from Saint-Lô. We talked about pregnant women. You have to imagine in what conditions people are evacuating under air bombings. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some old people who cannot walk so much. There are some families with many children. There were families, um, uh, there were women who were pregnant. There were wounded people. So uh, it was chaos, absolute chaos. But uh, some uh, in some other places, like Le Utrel town, they had been spared so they could help and they did. It was not because they could help, because they had been spared that uh, they all did, you know. Um, there were some towns where people were not uh, helping. They didn't want to hear about you. That was your problems. It was wartime. People were trying to get concerned about their families. And uh, at Le Utrel, the villagers were very welcoming and very helpful. So uh, many people of saint Lô. Uh, could survive, thank to them. It was a big problem to find food for everybody. And in all of the witnessings I read, um, it was always the same thing about eating. You know, they could always get some butter, cream, eggs, and even some meat. But they had trouble finding anything else like vegetables or bread. So uh, there was a little piece of bread with a lot of butter on top of because Normandy and especially the area of St. Louis was really, really a dairy region. And the farmers had to keep farm, uh, sorry, had to keep milking their cows so they could keep making butter and cream and uh, and so a lot of butter and cream and um, and uh, not much bread, not much vegetables, but they had something and. So, um, and, and, and Karina suggested to us when we were planning this show that we could actually film inside the uh, the, the hospital tunnels there. The, the difficulty is there'd be no signal. So what we will do in the future is we will actually try and do a proper my pro proper shows where I take my proper camera and film inside it and do an actual show about that, but not live. Uh, even if we got permission, it would just the signal would just disappear inside the rock. So it's an idea we thought about it and for the future, but we won't we won't be doing it. Um, this occasion. Duncan just going to show us a last view of the, I think he wanted to show, <coughs> Duncan hasn't shown us enough bullet holes quite yet. He's not quite bullet holed out for day. Um, and amazingly, despite the supposed accuracy of Allied bombing, we never actually get hit the bridge. Uh, the, well, that bridge, the bridge seemed to survive fairly well. So there's some, some fairly hefty uh, shrapnel damage and, and shell damage on the bridge there. But I, they're going to be heading back to the van now because I want to just squeeze in this last bonus stop before their camera batteries die. Don't jump in, Duncan. It's not worth it. We love you. Don't do it, Duncan. Don't. Um, and then we're going to go and sh see um, see how this last little bonus stop. It's not a. It's not an amazing. Well, it is an amazing. It's not an important. Uh, you'll see. And uh, Martin is saying, are the tunnels accessible to the public? Yes, they're available on certain days under certain guided tours. You can't just kind of walk in. 
they open them up on certain occasions during the year people to go inside so um you've done a fantastic job you two camera people so um we'll we'll while you're driving off to our last little bonus stop and sorry to bully you to do that um we'll we'll just sum up the events of san lo and the liberation and um we'll show you this last spot and talk a little bit more you know bring things to an end so so again i like we did with our con shows we are hoping that if you watch this and you've never been to san lo before you'll consider making a trip down there. There is stuff to see. Yes, there's lots of modern rebuilding. But if you know what you're looking at, there's a shell in the side of the church. There's shrapnel damage. There's bullet holes. There's the tunnels. There's La Chapelle de la Madeleine, which we could have, again, got permission to go inside, but it would have taken too long on this show. We will do a special there at some point when we'll have the uh, the, 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 guy, the curator open it up for us, and we can do that uh, in there. Uh, and, if you're, and, there's, and there's also in the other tunnel, there's a, one of the viewers is reminding me, there's a firing range, a gun club. Duncan was a member of that gun club up until a couple of years ago. And the noise, he says, he says the noise of firing, it's a 25 meter range, I think, inside there. And the noise of firing a rifle inside that range is, is, is just deafening because of the echo from the tunnel. So um, we're heading off now. That's it. We've got one more stop to go to. We'll let Karine kind of sum things up a bit about San Lo. We're going to show you a bonus stop that we really didn't think we'd get time to do, but we will. It'll be about a five minute drive, I suppose. So that was a little bit about the liberation of San Lo. It was a, it was when we're talking about all of the units that are pushing towards San Lo. Um, the 35th and 20th and 29th were heading for the city, but the 4th, the 1st, the 30th, the 83rd, they're all involved in the greater battle for San Lo in the sense that it's part of this push um, south from the beachhead. And of course, we um, we will at some point want to discuss in a, in a World War II TV show, Operation Cobra. The problem with Cobra, and there's that map I showed you earlier, because beyond San Lo, you get the breakdown uh, where Patton's Third Army goes off towards um, uh, Brittany, and there's the breakout here, and Vier and Vildier and Coutances. is in all this area here, kind of um, Perrier, set over here, is an absolute cell phone mobile phone dead zone we'll, we'll just get no see duncan used to live over here near coutons and sean who's been on a couple of my shows lives over here and the the cell phone reception there is just awful so i i think doing an operation cobra sh show would be really because we just won't be able to get a signal so we'd love to bring that to you at some point we will be doing shows over in the uh the the Falaise gap area definitely be doing that and of course next saturday we've got david o'keefe on and we're talking about the Operation Verrier Ridge. So here, here, see here where it says 25th of July, and you got the second SS Panzer Corps there. Well, that's um, and it says Can there for Connect Canada. That's the push um, to point, uh, point 67, uh, point point uh, set, which was an important ridge Verrier. So that's next Saturday's show with David O'Keefe in the afternoon. We're talking about that, the Canadian, the Canadian Black Watch pushing south to across wheat fields. So that's another show for another day. But they're heading off their final stop now. So that's that's Cobra that happens after San Lo. So you could affect, essentially, from the point of view of the Americans in Normandy, divide the Normandy campaign into the pre, the before San Lo chapter and the after San Lo chapter. It, remind, it, 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 it provides the dividing line between the two operations. And as Joe Balkowski said in the first show, he, believe, he maintains July the 11th was the kind of the first day, really, the American army got things right in Normandy, particularly the 29th Division with a combined arms, use of tanks, use of mortars, phosphorus grenades, engineers, and really dealing with the hedgerow countryside. So, um, well, they're, they're driving. So let's say, hope we see a uniform, unicorn flag at some point, but um, I don't know. We will. And again, you can just see for those, the last few shots of the center of San Lo. You know, it's a modern city. It could, in a sense, be anywhere in the world. It's just a, it's a modern, modern city. But anything, well, I'll let you talk a bit, Karine. I'll, I'll, I'll take a sip of water. I think it's the Rue Torteron. So Rue Torteron was part of these. Um, you, you remember when I said that it was like a big farming machine had dug a ditch across the city. So that was part of the areas where Jean Mignon said it was like this and uh, not much survived uh, in, on this side of the city. It was just, you know, destroyed buildings. And when the civilians who survived got out from the cellars of their houses before another air bombing started, they said they could hear people uh, shouting, calling for help uh, from the uh, 
um, ruins of the buildings and uh, there was nothing to do for them uh, except that there were some people from the Défense Passive who got organized to try and go to uh, get some uh, survivals. But there was another air bombing that happened very shortly after the first one and then another one a little later. So unfortunately, many people of saint Lô um, uh, died uh, after hours agonizing under the ruins of the buildings that had collapsed on, on themselves. Uh, you know, the people of this, these towns, like in Caen, they had a way to talk about the people who were discovered sometimes a long time after the destruction of their houses. They, they are telling that they were aplati in French, it means flattened, because under the ruins of the buildings, they were flat. And uh, you read a lot of uh, witnessings where they are telling, yeah, we found the members of this family. Oh, yes, they had been flattened as well mm. as this other family. They don't tell dead, you know, they don't tell they were killed. They say they were flattened. So they're heading off this final location now, which is um, a bit of a secret one. We didn't advertise, we didn't think there'd be time to do it. And they're going on the road past the Irish hospital. There's a there's a 29th Division hospital that has big connections. There's there's twin cities in you know uh, places in, in Virginia, particularly in Richmond and Lynchburg and Baltimore, and they all have these connections with 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 the, the Normandy region and. And if a 29th Division veteran is ill when he's in Norman, he will be taken to the 29th Division Hospital in San Lo. And there's these, these wonderful connections, you know, American and French connections. Like you get the same thing with the Canadians and the French up in the Canadian sector and the British and the French in the British sector. So this last stop is, is, is in the middle of a kind of a, a, a leafy suburb of San Lo. Now, this would have been an area much more in the countryside 76 years ago. And they're going to head off this little stop there. And... Um, can I interrupt you one yes, minute? Yes, of course you can. Not be long. You were talking about the Irish hospital that was set up after the war. Um, yeah. And there was a, a member of the Irish hospital who was famous in France, um, uh, Samuel Beckett, who was yeah. a famous author and poet. And uh, he's at the origin of this expression. He was the one who named saint lô the capital of ruins, which is a good way to describe the level of destruction of saint lô yes. So there they are in a little a little sort of suburb of, Sa of San Lo now and you're wondering why we've taken you here and I'm hoping again there'll be some people there's a bit of an old sunken lane there but I'll let Duncan explain because Duncan has a bit of a history with this tree don't you Duncan so uh so what are we looking at Duncan He's, he hasn't unmuted himself yet so this is a, a it's a they call it a sniper oh, there tree. I am. There we go, the sniper tree. And as you can see, there are metal rungs all the way up the tree. And uh, unfortunately, on the recce, I went up there. And just as I was getting down, I fell the last bit. And I ended up over here. So yes, that's the sniper's tree. I personally, looking at it, the way this has been done with the metal um footsteps going all the way up there. i think it was probably artillery i think this had been put here for some time for observation and it was probably used for artillery hitting the ridge because if i get up on top of the high piece here be careful duncan yeah be yeah, careful yeah, yeah. okay over there between the block of flat to my left my block of flat yep. to my left and the tree on the right that there is the ridge where we were this afternoon where Major Howie went down. I'll, I'll, I'll show a map, Duncan. Hang on, I'll show Please, the map. Yeah. So, so this is San. This is a map of San Lo as it was then. Okay, so it's expanded quite a lot now. So there's La Madeleine, which is just south. So the track we kind of came down where where Howie um, was killed. We started over here at La Luzerne, La Luzerne, Bellefontaine. We went off to Martinville here, and we walked. See this arrow here? There's there's May, uh, well, Bingham first. Bingham's pushed down towards that track and Mag and Duncan walked down there. And where Duncan is now is kind of over here, basically. So it's been swallowed up by San Loan there at the time. You can imagine, you can see the contour lines here. You can see they're doing a really good view across to the ridge where from the, from the earlier show. So that's what 
and I can I'm, I'm with Duncan. I think that's a that's an artillery observer tree, not a sniper tree. But sniper's more of a label. And the thing is, of course, a sniper is you don't fire consistently from one position because when you go up that tree and fire a rifle at someone, someone will see the they'll, they'll hear the shot. They'll they'll see you moving. You'd want to relocate. It's that myth in the movies of putting snipers in church towers. It's observers in church towers is more common than snipers per se. So given, as Duncan said there, the how elaborate those rungs are, I think, and Duncan thinks that's much more likely that that's an artillery observer's position. And you can certainly see in in and in, in read in the accounts that Joe has so wonderfully written about and beyond the beach, the Germans are very, very good at observation. So our hunch is that's where some some Fritzy was up there in June, the July the 11th, 12th and 13th and was directing fire on the 29th division from that tree. And I'm, we, it's wonderful that the people of San Lo have just incorporated that tree into their into their housing estate. And um, if anyone wants to email us and tell, we'll tell you how to get there. It's 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 easy to find if you know where you're going. It's you're not going to find it unless you drive for it. You, you'd have you have to drive out of the city a, co a couple of clicks. But there you are. There's the rungs there. That was the bonus I was going to do. So we think we truly believe that is a German artillery position or observer's position. It may well, Shell Drake 6 is watching. It may well have been used by the allies to observe as well because don't forget as i showed you on the breakout map we're pushing on ourselves ourselves towards via so maybe the allies used it as well if they found it of course because there's no guarantee with all the chaos in san lo they ever found that but so that, that there's a good chance that that artilleryman up there if the observer was directing a fire on martinville ridge where where we lost major harry in the earlier show so as far as i'm concerned that's kind of things to an end there we've just gone on about 10 minutes more than run time do you want to give yourself a selfie view, Mag and Duncan, so we can say thank you to you? Just swing the cat. There's Mag. So there's, there's Mag. Thank you very much, Mag. Everyone's been congratulating you on your wonderful job. And Duncan, again, brilliant. Nice hat you got there, Duncan. There's World War II TV hats. So you've done a fantastic job. I will let, and thanks, thank Francois as well for driving. And then I'll let you drive back to, uh, and we'll see you in a half an hour or so, 40 minutes or so. So thank you very much, guys. You did a fantastic job. And um, yeah, brilliant stuff. So um, I'll let you drive back. Anything you want to say, Mag, as a as born in any while? Last closing remark, Mag? Yes, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the hospital. Uh, the hospital where I was born, called uh, the American Memorial Hospital, and uh, it was called that like that because uh, end of the 40s, when they decided to build it, there's um, an American committee uh, called Aid for France that um, contributed, you know, that uh, financed a bit of it. Uh, and when it was inaugurated in 1955, it was the most modern hospital in Europe. Oh, brilliant stuff and i think we'll end the show and tim tim blicks one of my supporters is watching and i think we'll end the show with saying a, a profound thank you to the to the, the the allies who fought their way through san lo and those who lost their lives but also spread spare some thought for the poor french civilian victims who were unfortunately um in the way of the allied advance and you know we we don't as allies we didn't mean to kill french villains it was just one of those unnecessary or necessary evils to eradicate the nazi and grip on europe if so, i can can just add something in normandy we've lost um, as we said earlier about 20,000 civilians which is a third of um, civilians we've lost in in france so normandy paid a uh, heavy price for its freedom and um, that's something um, you know, we, we don't forget here. Well, thank you, Megan. I think we can see that all those people like Martin and Joe who are watching this, we all know that the people of Normandy, because they suffered so greatly, I think that's why they show their gratitude so warmly. And Mag and I have been on vacation to places in France where there are bunkers and things like that to see. And, and the French there perhaps aren't as interested, not, not disinterested, but it's not as important in other parts of France as it is in Normandy because they had to suffer to get their liberation. I think in that it's that old thing, you, you appreciate something more if you've had to fight for it. And I think the people of France, of Normandy, had to absolutely fight for their freedom like the Allies did. And um, and they paid the price. So there we are, guys. Don't, don't leave Duncan behind, Francois. 
And I thank you. Hello, Francois. There's Wave, Wave Francois. We love you, Francois. Francois is another excellent tour guide. He, he, he'll <laughs> take you around the, the, the sites of Normandy as well. He's linked to his all Duncan, Mag, and Karine, and uh, Francois' sites all in the links below. When things travel begins again, you can book any one of those and get a great experience. So I'll I'll, cl I'll close you out now, you two guys, and I'll just finish off things with Karine and we'll, we'll bring it to end. So I'll see you later. I'll, 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 okay. I'll get the coffee, the kettle on for you, Duncan. Right, so there we are, Karine. So thank you, you've done a fantastic job there. And, I, and from my point of view, I think these two shows, the earlier one and this one, have bookended very nicely. We did the battling one of Joe giving us all the tech tactical improvements the 29th, and you've given us some amazing stuff about the civilian experience and the history of the city. So people have enjoyed it. So I'm going to say thank you to those watching. And again, the same thing. If you haven't already subscribed to World War II TV on the YouTube channel, please click subscribe. You can click the little bell to get notifications. And we do, we, we are asking for some help via Patreon to get, so we can make more of these. And so I can kind of do this full time if possible and, and uh, reimburse people eventually if, if that would be nice. And uh, so with our next show, We've got the Dan Danish Denmark at war on the 24th, Operation Spring, very air ridge on the 25th. And the 29th, we've got our um, Battle of Atlantic special, which I'm really looking for. There's a panel discussion. We've got Mark Milner, a Canadian, um, Brian Walter, an American, and we've got Ian Ballantyne, a Brit. So four of us will thrash out the Battle of Atlantic, which I will say on record now, the most important battle of World War II is the Battle of the Atlantic. If we had not controlled the, the, the seas of the Atlantic, there is no invasion, there is no battle, there's no liberation of Russia, there's no, without controlling all that. So we'll talk about U-boats and, and surface raiders and convoys. And, and of course, we've just all seen some of us, Tom Hanks's new film, Greyhound. So a very topical time to talk about the Battle Atlantic. And we will have Karine again on something in the future. We'll do something about civilians or, and Karine's got a superb knowledge of, of the cultural side of France, as well as the, as the World War II stuff. So as you can tell by her knowledge of cathedrals and ramparts and stuff. So Karine, it's been a pleasure having you on, on the show again. And um, thank you very much. Anything you'd like to finish off with? Please. No, I think we've did, we've said a lot of things already. So it was a pleasure for me too. Thank you for the job you're doing, and uh, would be a pleasure to do it again in the future. We will. So I'm going to end the stream. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you again soon on World War Two TV. And thanks, Karine, Duncan, Mag, and Francois. This is me saying good night. So there we are. We're done. That's it. End the stream.